think it's really helpful for people to hear you say, you know, that there are things that scare you, right? Um, people, um, I think a lot of folks think if you move through your career, you've had enough years in, even when you make changes that, you know, it's not as risky or you may not be as scared, right? Because you're at an elevated level from, you know, outside in. And so I think it's important for people to, to hear that and to hear that um, you're evolving and constantly trying to right reach a new level and change no matter how long you've been in the game. So that's helpful. Um, and speaking of you know risk, um, this question is for you, Danielle. Um, I think a lot of lawyers are we're trained to be risk averse, right? That's what we do. We find the risk, <laughs> we attack it, protect it. Particularly those of us you know that are in firms. That's really law school and the firm setting is that trains you for that. Um, so what kind of advice do you have for folks kind of shaking that and working through that? Because when you're working at your own career, you have got to figure out a way to, to be able to take risks. Right. Def so I totally agree that lawyers tend to be risk averse. I think as a lawyer, I do tend to be one. So what I try to do and I recommend others is to kind of change your perspective and think about it from in terms of regret. Would you regret not making that leap or making that change? Um, so maybe kind of sort of similarly, I was working in a law firm for two years and well one year at the time and I thought oh I really wanted to do a clerkship I had never applied I was busy planning my wedding graduating I don't know from law school <laughs> etc and I thought like oh this would be crazy to you know stop making this big salary at the law firm to kind of take a step back and do a clerkship I mean I luckily talked to my husband and he supported me although he did say oh we can't move and I thought uh oh, clerkships are very competitive it doesn't work that way but I had to just believe in myself and apply and it all worked out and it was really one of the best decisions I made um, I ended up clerking here in Northern District of California for Judge Alsop because it was like a boot camp. So I just learned a lot of information, broadened my skills beyond just patent litigation. I was exposed to all different types of litigation. Also really gained a lifelong mentor so far um, for me. He's just opened so many doors and it continues to be there to answer questions and everything. So it was really worth it. Um, so it, was, it felt risky at the time, but I had no problem going back to a law firm afterwards. Um, so it paid off. So I think sometimes it's it makes sense to take that leap and things will work out in the end. Having, you know, really trusting in yourself, I think is the key theme. A lot of people talked about making moves and, and risk, but at the heart of it is all the work that you all put in to get into that position. Um, and so similarly, same thing, Jolyn, like yeah. what advice would you have for people who are, you know, just afraid to make that change? Mm -hmm. There is some level of comfort when you've been doing mm -hmm. sim same or similar work yeah. for a long time. You know, my, I had an old principal that used to say, the devil you know is the devil, better than the devil you don't know. Exactly. Um, and really kind of shaking that yeah. off and figuring out how to push yourself yeah. into the next level. I think the first thing is to understand how to make calculated risk. Mm -hmm. So making sure that you can do as much as you can to either mitigate the risk, do worst case scenario planning, getting a lot of data. It's funny, as I've taken on new roles, I always say to myself, I didn't ask enough questions every time. <laughs> So I've gotten better at making sure I get all my information and data asked up front. But you can sometimes never get to that point where it's going to be no risk. Um, so it, you also have to think through what's the worst that could happen? What, what's my exit plan if this doesn't end up working out? How do I have the internal sponsorship or management or even my external plan together if this is not going to work out for me in this particular role or scenario? So. Um, I do what I can to leverage that attorney skill to mitigate risk um, and to make sure that the risk I'm taking is ca are as calculated as they can be. And at the end of the day are gonna be ones that I can look back and be satisfied with or feel like um, from, a, from a no regret scenario, am I gonna be happy that I move forward with this opportunity? I also think as you move to different phases and you sit in places of fear, you become more and more comfortable with that. So the first time that I, I was telling Adele's me, like when I uh, moved on to DNI from employment law, it was a different thing. Because when you show up in the room as the scary lawyer threatening litigation, you're about to get sued and deposed, people take your meeting right away. Like they don't hesitate to make time for you on your calendar. Now here I was presenting myself wanting to talk about diversity, inclusion, and talent, and belonging, and authenticity, and a business. And not everybody wanted to take, make that a priority in their day. And I was not used to that feeling. So there was this moment of panic um, and regret. So now I also know that about myself. It's like I will make a decision to take a risk or do something different. 
and maybe 30 seconds later, I'm like, oh my God, I just made the biggest mistake of my career. But now I know that's my process, and I like sit in that space and know that through that change, through that struggle, there's something better on the other side. And I'm really happy to say that the, like, you know, I've been fortunate enough that the risks that I've taken in my career and the things that I've been able to do have gotten me so much more reward than if I had just sat in one space and didn't expose myself to those experiences. And I think I'm just such a better leader and contributor and person from being in those spaces. So um, now I know that and it doesn't feel so daunting anymore. Yeah. I mean, I think that's, a, that's right on point, right? Just um, you understand kind of your process yeah. and how that all works. And also the point that you made as well um, really hit home and just you've tried to make those risks calculated, right? You do your homework, you understand what you're kind of walking into. And so then, you know, whatever the result is, you can live with it because yeah. you've sort of studied at that. The, at least you got the information up front. So ask a lot of questions. I always feel like I didn't ask enough. <laughs> You should ask more. Yes. <laughs> yes. Um, so this is for you, Jolyn, as well. Um, so speaking of, you know, taking risks, and advocacy is a big issue, mm -hmm. um, being able to speak up for ourselves. And when the timing is right to go for it, um, you know, timing is everything. So when is the timing right or perhaps not, in your opinion, to go for it and advocate for yourself? Um, well, I think you should always advocate your, for yourself. It's not, it, it, you know, but I think you also have to have a plan around it. So, um, and if we're talking about it from a sense of a promotion or a compensation increase, or if you are going into that new role, um, you know, it's really important to understand that if you don't advocate for yourself, in many ways, uh, who else is gonna advocate for you? And so, again, from the, having the benefit of being an employment lawyer and sort of seeing how things navigate from that perspective, I was able to see the things that people asked for. <laughs> and like, I'm telling you in your organizations right now, there are things that people are asking for that you think are outrageous, but they are asking with, for it with no hesitation. And so it made me feel like, well, why am I putting these restraints on myself to feel like I'm not empowered to or entitled to that, that ask that someone else feels so bold to go for? And so that's the first things first, like recognize that ask are being made. You have to know when you're entitled to it, when you've earned it, be empowered to demand it for yourself, and then have a strategy and a plan for how you're gonna make that ask. Be strategic about it. What information can you gather in advance? Who can sponsor you as part of what you're going to be asking for? What have been the historical um, uh, sort of decisions around the position that you might be taking? How do you need to position yourself with either that person or individual who might be making a decision? Who really has the power to um, give you what you want? So I think um, it's important to, one, believe in your opportunity to demand that ask, understand that other people are doing it, so don't be left out, and three, um, you know, make sure that you have done your homework so you can be strategic about, about that ask. Yeah. I mean, I think that's huge, right? When you end up in a management position, you get to see all the things that are being asked uh, for, and you then are in a position of approval, right? Um, so it's interesting looking back, you know, um, Danielle, is that something kind of that you've seen as well where you're kind of like, wow, I can't, I can't believe that, you know, that's really an, an amazing ask. And I, I wonder if I should have been asking for that <laughs> earlier in my career. Uh, yes, yes, definitely. I know from one of my past jobs in particular, watching my boss and just her method of, you know, uh, things she was doing and basically was like a long-term plan that she was working on, but it wasn't always clear what the goal was, but it just seemed like more work. <laughs> a lot of time for us. But for example, one thing was presentations. Just doing presentations to our entire legal department about the progress we had made on investigations. I mean, I must say that we thought our team was killing it, but part of it is we could know that, but if everyone else doesn't know that when it comes times for discussing, uh, for the VPs to get together and discuss promotion, for example, you know, you want your VP and your particular group to advocate for you, but it's also helpful if other ones and other groups can advocate for you. So I think it's important to sort of do your homework, have a plan, also market for yourself um, in your department. Because people are definitely doing it. Um, yeah. And 
Adele Mies, that's, that speaks to another point in understanding kind of the importance of organizational culture, right? Whether it's just on your team, somebody else's team you want to get onto, a certain business unit. Um, in the law firm setting, it could be just a client trial team that people are you know, itching to get on. How important is it to really understand that culture? It is hugely important. Um, I, you know, I have countless examples, but I think a couple of things, oftentimes when I'm mentoring sort of more junior people or people that have, whether they're in my organization or not, they think, well, I just, I deserve this. I'm just gonna go in and make the ask. Um, unfortunately, if you don't understand the culture, whether it's your team, the leadership, right? Uh, and, and, or the, who makes the decision, you're gonna come in, you're unfortunately not gonna get what you asked for. Sometimes it may backfire. I've unfortunately been on the other side of it where I didn't prepare enough, not prepared knowing what I could get because as an employment lawyer, I know that there are certain asks you may make because of the way the rules are written, the policies, you're not gonna get them. You can be creative. Um, and so I know what not to ask for and I know what to ask for that if it's not in the policy, well you can put it in my contract or you can, you know, whatever that is. So I, I know how to make those asks. But I think understanding the, the culture of your organization is key. Um, I also think that something that I do, relationship is so important, and I, I can't underscore enough. When you walk into a company or a team, you may be the most brilliant, amazing lawyer, HR person, salesperson, finance, whatever that is. If you don't have those relationships, your ability to make the ask and actually have them be successful may not work. One of the things I try to do is, as I'm going in, you probably have heard the um, term personal board of directors. I have my own personal board of directors that includes my husband, and I check, you know, not that I give his permission or anything, but yeah, I we know We know that, we know that, yeah. <laughs> I, but I check things with him to make sure, like, balance it off of him. I've been married for almost 22 years next month, and it's important for us to talk about, like, this is what I'm gonna go for. Uh, it includes my mother, uh, I always balance that she will keep me real, but I have a couple people at work who they're those who are in positions to have information. And that is part of understanding the culture of the company. If they have information about either what ask may work, the timing of things when you're asking for a raise or you want the promotion, if the decisions are made in October and you come in December thinking, oh, they're gonna announce it in February, guess what? It's too late, right? But knowing how you get that information is important. And also understanding the who you're making the ask. And learning that sometimes the person who you're asking for may not have your best interest at heart. Mm -hmm. And you need to figure out a, a, a way, not necessarily to go above their head, but f build your network so that when you do make the ask, they don't really have a way out. And so that's why I think it's really important to understand those dynamics. I mean, and I, I, I yeah. totally echo what you're saying, and there's maybe one more that I perhaps want to add. Um, understanding your requirements and not talking yourself out of those things in advance is also important. And I'll give you an example. So um, at some point, at a point in my career, I was uh, moved on to chief diversity officer. I was now working within HR. I wanted to sort of do my whole tour of HR since I was there. I'm like, okay, if I'm gonna do this HR thing, let me go big. So I had the point. Um, to add to my role to uh, be the CHRO for our president, our marketing and sales organization. At that point though, I'd recently found out that I was pregnant with twins, which was gonna put me in the position to have three kids under three. Mm -hmm. And this was a global role, um, supporting an HR organization of individuals around the world. It was one of our biggest functions at Visa. Um, and I just, the person who had done the role before me traveled all the time, was always on a plane. I'm like, there's just no way, I can't, this job's not for me, I can't do it. So I, I, my CHR at the time, one, I appreciated that he asked me, both of us, people thought we were crazy, because he didn't make a decision for me, like, oh, this, this is a mother, she's getting ready to have twins, clearly she's not gonna want a, move, a new job, but he actually asked me and allowed me to make a choice. And I initially said no, I said, no, I don't, I can't do this job, because I'm gonna have these babies, and. I can't be on a plane every weekend. And then I went home and my husband was like, what's wrong? And the type A lawyer in me was like, I don't know what I just did again. I just made a mistake. This is an opportunity and what was I doing? And it's the president, why did I do that? And he's like, well, what's the problem? I'm like, well, I can't travel. And he's like, well, who said you had to travel? I'm like, well, the other person did. Right. 
So clearly that's what's needed in the role. He's like, really? Did you ask anybody that? <laughs> <laughs> no. So I went back <laughs> and I had a conversation with my CHRO and the president. I'm like, listen, I'm excited. I want to do this job and listen, and I promise you I'm going to work really hard. I'm talented and I have a lot to offer. But I'm getting ready to go on a maternity leave for five months and I'm going to have three kids under three and I cannot travel all the time. And they're like, okay. That's simple, right? So I was clear, I put my requirements on the table and I was clear on it. Mm -hmm. And if they had said no, then at least I would have known. But I asked. So it's really important that you don't presume um, how something has to be done just because someone else has done it another way. I was just gonna add another quick point. There are lots of questions you asked, obviously they're related in something Jolyn said in terms of you kind of talk yourself out of uh, advocating, for, advocating for yourself um, I went through the MLT CAP program, the Management Leadership for Tomorrow's Career Advancement Program, and we, I was fortunate enough we get an executive coach with that. And um, at that time, it came at a critical moment in my career, and one of the things that coach told me after like, you know, I talked to him and I'll be bawling my eyes out, so I'm like, no, I can't do this, I, you know, what if it doesn't work? One of the things he says, what prevents you from advocating for what you want is the fear that you might either fail or you would let others down. Mm -hmm. And for me, the others were my family. Mm -hmm. You know, I'm the oldest in my family. I'm the everything to everybody, the banker, the counselor, the, you know, you name it. And I have three children that I can't fail. Right. And so I tend to say, well, I'm just gonna stay where I'm at, where I feel comfortable. And he says, that cripples you. If you remove that, what if you fail? Mm -hmm. What happens? What's the worst that will happen? And once you go through that exercise, I've gotten more comfortable to say, you know what, I am going to push for this. Mm -hmm. And if they, the worst they're gonna say is no, in which case I'm back to where I was. And I was like, well, maybe then I stay or I don't. Yeah. Um, and so that was really important. I think the fear of failure or letting others down mm -hmm. sometimes can prevent us from actually advocating for what we want or just taking on that, that, that risk that perhaps we don't know if it's gonna work out. So. And so many of us deal with that, right? So many of us have this fear of, I cannot let others down. We feel responsible for a lot, for a many, many, many things. So having a sounding board, I think, um, is just huge because you have that ability to talk it through with somebody who goes, well, why not? <laughs> why shouldn't you make that ask? Um, and uh, it kind of goes to my next question or my next topic, which is, you know, just meeting with you ladies even briefly, I can tell you all are very comfortable with who you are. And so um, I think that you're very true you know, to yourselves. And how do people really balance staying true to who they are, navigating these cultures we're talking about, <laughs> figuring out how to make the right moves, but also just being yourself? Danielle, I'll throw that out to you first. Yeah, so I think this is a very interesting topic. And just funny enough, I was having lunch with my husband. We were talking about it. Um, because a lot of the tech companies in Silicon Valley in particular, you know, the idea is to be yourself, bring your whole self to work. And we were sort of talking about that, like, well, do we bring our whole selves to work? I think I do bring a lot of myself to work, but uh, it has my husband sort of framed it as like, well, you go to your grandmother's house, do you bring all of you in? <laughs> no, you still have to be respectful and et cetera. So I think it's the same idea in your um, environment. You have to, depends on which corporate environment you're in, like definitely working at a tech company is, you know, a little bit more, you can bring more of yourself maybe than I could have brought at the law firm, which was more corporate. Mm -hmm. So definitely taking a look at your organization, the culture, and what's acceptable, uh, I think is important. And, um, but at the end of the day, I think in the Bay Area, we are fortunate that, you know, I grew up in the South, well, I guess maybe you guys don't know, in Mississippi. So it's very different that I'm able to probably be more of myself here than I was there. I mean, I grew up in segregated schools, <laughs> and so it's a very different world and compared to the openness and acceptance I think you can often find here in the Bay Area. Well, I think that's definitely true for the work environment here. It's kind of different, even in the law firm setting. You know, you might find different firms that have different cultures, but overall, a lot of that is driven by some of the tech companies and the culture overall in California. Um, but yeah, I think it is an interesting balance. It's something that a lot of people struggle with. And I think finding the right fit where you can be as much of yourself as possible is really the key because otherwise it seems like, you know, there's a lot of energy put into trying to be what other people sort of want right. you to be. And then you can't really focus on flourishing. 
So yeah, I think if you have to decide if that's something important to you, particularly when you're going to maybe a new company, it's assessing like what the company culture is. If it's a matter of reaching out to connection, you know who already works there, or connection of connection, or you know reading reviews online and trying to assess that as much as possible, or doing a second visit sometimes um, to a place can be important. I mean, I did have a a uh, short stint at one company, I won't name it, <laughs> but it was one of those instances where the position sounded really great, my title sounded great, the few people I interviewed were great, but ultimately the company culture was a terrible fit. Um, the company had a lot of turnover and I left shortly, not too long after being there, but so I definitely dig deep and try to find out as much information as you can. Um, Adele means, you know, um, there are some challenges, right, in the workforce for a lot of different groups, and I think that women and minorities uh, face some, some unique challenges. Um, can you speak a little bit um, with folks about how you've addressed some of those challenges that have come up in your career? Um, yeah, for me, uh, you know, a couple of them particularly, I think. Um, one is what I call sort of um, access to information or to people. Um, I think as people of color, uh, particular women of color, we assume sort of when you come in, you're gonna have, you know, if I do good work, um, I'm a great lawyer, I'm a great whatever, uh, well, the promotion's coming, or the, the next project will come, right? And that's not always the case, and I think it's really hard to know, especially if you don't have people look like you, um, and you know, having been at law firms, I've, I've been in too many instances where I was the only one. And so not knowing if I can trust someone to have access to the information, when is the next deal coming, right? When is the next case coming? Will I actually know, right? If there's a client meeting and you're in-house, the head of HR is meeting with you know, somebody on the board, how am I gonna know in order to ask for a seat at the table? So access to information, to people, is very challenging, I think, in any environment where you're at. So it's very important, you, you know, I know we're gonna talk about mentoring, but if you don't have anybody who looks like you, find somebody you trust. Find somebody who will sit down with you and share that information um, with you so that you can get it. And the other thing I think is, again, going back to sort of the bringing your whole self to work, I also think we have to, you have to scan the room, you have to scan your environment. Um, and it's hard to do that when you are not um, having the opportunity to, to interact with a lot of people. Um, and so for me, every place that I go and every role I have, I try to make a point to figure out like, what's the landscape, right? Like who am I going to reach out to to talk to when the challenges are um, coming? And so those are a couple ones I think in terms of challenging and just having um, the opportunities from people to, to mentor you. It's hard. Jolyn, we talked a little bit before about, you know, having good EQ and having the ability to really read the room yeah. and kind of understand uh, what you're walking into and understanding, right, sort of the lay of the land. Can you speak to that a little bit? Yeah, it's a totally underestimated superpower, I think, and one that we, <laughs> We, um, I think, as, as women and people of color, um, have had to understand how to navigate dichotomies in different spaces, and therefore it gives us uh, perhaps an enhanced or ability to um, read scenarios and leverage that EQ. And so I think um, being able to uh, understand that background of like what's going on in the room, where, what are the dynamics of a particular organization, who can I really trust to help sponsor me, how can I get my sources of information, um, whether or not they be uh, big and small. I think on our pre-call, for example, we talked about, you know, uh, there are both senior leaders who can be sponsors and mentors and really help you, but there, I mean, if you wanna get an executive's calendar, a relationship with an executive EA is secret sauce, like fantastic <laughs> thing to know. And so I think that ability to kind of have uh, relationships and um, be able to build, uh, you know, resources both up and down the chain in an organization is incredibly important. I also think that as you get into positions in your career where you can help demonstrate authenticity, um, yeah, you should. So again, as an example, I know for me, I speak very openly about being a mother. I speak very openly about ending a meeting at five o'clock because I gotta go. Um, my very first time that I, when I had my son, I. Uh, was very um, intense about the leave and being out of work, and I just perhaps didn't leverage the time that I weigh in the way that I should have. 
Uh, when I had my, my daughters, at that point, I was the chief diversity officer. Um, I'd done a lot of work around helping improve our benefits at the company. And I took every ounce of my time and was very open about that. Um, and it's, I think it's important that you, again, help model that authenticity, especially when you get into positions where you can role model that for others in your organization. Definitely relationships are key. That's the common theme we've all talked about. Um, and relationships up and down, horizontal throughout the organization. Um, I've spoken to folks who have told me stories about, you know, having a relationship with a security guard um, in the building <laughs> yeah, that was able to true. get them in, right, to get that box of whatever they <laughs> needed exactly. so they could make that presentation. So, true. so I never worry about not having my badge. I know my guy's yeah. going <laughs> to let me in. <laughs> Some right. people would have to go home. I'm like, no, he's going to let me in. Yeah. Or the <laughs> IT, the IT person. Yeah. Yeah. The computer is locked. Totally. Right, <laughs> right. Um, and Danielle, we talked a little bit before about, you know, mentors, right, can come in the most sort of surprising settings. So can you speak to that? Because I think that um, one misnomer is that your mentor has to look like you. Mm -hmm. yeah, yeah, so definitely that was common misnomer that I heard about when I worked at a law firm in particular, because just junior black associates in particular um, were coming to the law firm and there was only maybe one black partner. And you know, he can't be a mentor to everyone. <laughs> he only had so much time and effort, even though he tried his best. Um, <laughs> but the idea is sometimes you try to look for a mentor maybe who doesn't look like you, who doesn't have the same personality as you do. You can maybe find other things in common. And I think I have been fortunate along the way to sort of have get mentors um, throughout my life at different points. For example, I guess my judge would be a good example. Uh, he's a white male. He is from Mississippi, so we both have that connection. But, you know, it's a small connection. We didn't, uh, we didn't grow up in the same city or something like that. But I think that still was enough for us to establish a long-term mentorship relationship. Um, so, yes, just, you know, find those mentors, follow up. I even have, you know, several different mentees, and I think I learned different things from them. Uh, one in particular, I went to Georgetown Law School, and so they have a program there where they assign you a mentee. And he has graduated, he's off, he's flourishing, but he does such an excellent job of keeping up. Like, when will you be in D.C. this year? <laughs> will you stop by and, you know, let's catch up? So I think, you know, that inspires me to try to do the same thing when I go to different cities to reach out to people and make sure I keep those connections going because you just never know it's a small world. And I guess also another story related to being a small world is um, where mentorships are just you know, I'm keeping those connections going is that my current boss at VMware used to be a partner at the law firm where I was there. So you just never know about, I guess, where that, where you can end up and end up working with someone. So always, you know, be respectful of your mentors <laughs> and work hard and try to impress them along the way. Because you may end up working together in some other capacity. I mean, this is a great relationship to have, right? And who knew that it was gonna turn into what it turned into for you today. Mm -hmm. um, so you kind of touched on a, a point that I wanted to ask Adele Meese about, which is um, being a good mentee. And it, relationship building um, in any setting, it's a two-way street, right? right? And I think for a lot of, of us, no matter where we are, we think about being a, you know, we want a mentor. Mm -hmm. But what, what would you say to folks about really trying to focus on, you know, driving that relationship, following up, being a really good mentee? Yeah, definitely. I think sometimes it can be hard um, to... Uh, be a good mentee, and that's why sometimes it doesn't work. Um, a couple of tips, I think. One is it's really, really important to be honest with the mentor you have. I've heard several times people say, well, I'll go ask somebody, you know, Jolyn, will you be my mentor? Or Monica, will you be? I've never done that, and I don't know that it would work very well, because you kind of have to build it organically, right? And once you have that relationship, being very open and honest about what are you interested in? What are your expectations? What are your aspirations? What are your challenges? What are you afraid of, right? Like, what are the things you feel like, you know, I just don't know how to navigate through that and allow them to actually help you think through them, but not necessarily give you the answer. One of my best mentors is someone who literally will, if I have an issue, I'll say, I just need an hour of your time. And I'm a big person, like, I go have coffee. If I know them enough, I'll go have wine. That's my litmus. I'm like, we'll go have a, a glass of wine, but I have to really know you, right? Like, not some, you know. But um, find the time, make sure they understand you're gonna put the time, and be specific about what it is that you need to talk to them about. Mentors are very busy. If you go and you're like, well, I'm not really sure, not happy in my job, 
or like, you know, I'm struggling, I think I want this, it's not gonna be helpful. So be very intentional, be very specific, and share what your aspirations are, what do you want, um, and also be okay with if they come back and say, you know what, I don't have the answer, but here are two people I would like you to talk to. Don't take the business card and say, well, you know, ne next time. Follow up, because they're using their own personal capital with their own relationships to actually make that connection, and if you don't follow up, then it becomes like, well, what's the point of me trying to mentor you? Um, so I think those are kind of some of the tips I would give to folks. And JoLynn, can you speak a little bit to this, you know, just looking at being specific and the fact that, you know, all of your hopes and dreams don't have to be wrapped up in one mentor, right? You can have I was just gonna say lots that. Like having yeah. topical mentors is yeah. probably sometimes important as well. There are people who navigate different things. And so, you know, in the same way you have your own personal board of directors or even in your friend group, you're like, okay, if I need a shopping or a fashion critic, that's my friend that I go to. If I need somebody who's gonna give me a restaurant review, like that's who I go to. It's the same in a company. Um, there are people who have their centers and subject matter expertise. There are people who are sometimes, you know, the shoulder that you can lean on when you need um, a good venting session. There are others who are gonna give you that tough love. So I think uh, making sure that it's topical is, is not a bad thing as well. And having a wide variety of mentors across different disciplines and backgrounds and dimensions and not just to your point, looking for the people who have the most in common with you again, is really, I think, powerful, a powerful piece of your network. Have you had, you know, more, certainly more than one mentor when you've kind of been moving through in your career? I think so. I think, I mean, and there's definitely this word mentor. We're sort of using it interchangeably in terms of talking. There's mentor and there's sponsors, right? People who, um, some people who are gonna be those sounding boards to use and others who are gonna help push and advance your career in a powerful way. And they can be both. It could be both in the same person. Um, and so I, I think for me, certainly, I've definitely had mentors, I've definitely had sponsors, I've had individuals who are sponsoring me and I didn't know they were sponsoring me. Um, and so I think it's all about, you know, it being conscious in your interactions. Um, one, making sure that you are kind of on your job and doing your work. I say that to people who I um, help mentor and, and work with now, and I'm like, listen, the first thing you can do for yourself is be good, be good at your job, because then that, enables me to help support you, push you along, get you on that assignment, drop a word about the things that you're doing well, because you're already doing well. If, if you come to me and by the time it's like, well now I'm on a, you know, things aren't going well and I got this bad review and I'm like, oh God, okay, well now I'm pulling out my network externally to look at <laughs> where I can maybe help you transition. So, um, you know, I think that's the most important is like really, and I think about it for myself, like, Work, working hard and building that brand and um, making sure that you know I'm bringing something to the table, it really helps in that position of developing that relationship from a mentor sponsorship perspective. I just wanna add one quick point to, um, to not forget that your mentor can also be someone who is not necessarily your supervisor. It can be somebody who is who actually reports into you. Um, I've had mentors and again topical Right, uh, uh, one example recently, I was applying for this fellowship, uh, the Eisenhower Fellowships, and I had the opportunity to go in and do the interviews, and I was, again, I was scared. Uh, I was like, well, do, what if I don't get it? You know, all that, and I remember talking to one of my employees, and he says, I don't know if you want me to tell you this. And I was like, okay, sure, go ahead. And he said, well, if you don't do it, will you regret it? And I said, probably. He said, what are you afraid of? Well, what if I don't get it? Right, and so he says, knowing you, if you don't do it, you're gonna regret it, and if you go, you have a 50-50% chance that you will get it. And so he sat me down and actually got me to think through what's the worst that's gonna happen and really help me get out of my own head. And at that moment, I thought, well, I'm supposed to be giving you advice, right? <laughs> Not the other way around, yeah. but it was amazing. And I ended up getting the, the fellowship, and the first thing I did when I got the letter, I called him, I said, do you remember when you talked me into doing this? I got it. Yeah. And he said, I knew you would. So just don't lose sight of like your mentor doesn't have to be somebody who's you know, the GC of your company or the CHRO, it can be somebody who reports to you as well. Yeah, I would like to add to that too because I was just thinking as well like a mentor or not necessarily a mentor but someone who can help you take the steps that you want to take or like 
make you retain your goals could also be a peer or a friend. I was just thinking about the fact that I wanted to be on a nonprofit board and I had no idea, you know, how to start on this path, but I had a really good friend who was on several boards. So just approaching him about, okay, how did you do it? How did you choose? You know, how were you what was the process for selection and things like that? So definitely, you know, use all those avenues that are available to you. I, I totally don't want to under um, I want to also underscore the point that it can be up and down an organization because, I, and you can learn a lot from the people that you're mentoring. Back to that sense of knowledge and information. Again, particularly senior executives, they don't necessarily have their ear to the streets of what's happening in organization. Um, but because my, my relationships are broad and I talk to a lot of different people, including my mentees, you know, I may be able to bring them a piece of information. They're like, how did you know that? And I'm like, I heard it from the new grad. <laughs> So, I which ends people. up, I right, people. I know people. <laughs> so, which ends up giving you kind of that information flow that some people are like, wow, Joanne always kind of knows everything. I'm like, why well, keep a broad network? So it can be definitely, it could be helpful to you as well. I mean, I think that's all fantastic information and it's something people need to, you know, think about their careers and be the, be the proactive, right, advocate for themselves. Um, that's a, sort of a common theme we've run into, which is where we find that it's sometimes hard for us to advocate for ourselves. And so having a peer group or mentor, mentee, somebody, some sounding boards, whether it's husband, wife, partner, um, that you can really reach out to who, who really know you and will be real with you is, is key.